I have the pleasure of oops, introducing Sarah Brake, who is a professor of sociology and gender and sexuality at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Before that, she taught at different universities in Belgium and held visiting uh, positions at UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley, and Harvard University. Sarah was trained in sociology of religion and in culture and philosophy at the Catholic University of Levin in Belgium and received her PhD in, in women's studies from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Sarah's work has looked at the question of agency and subjectivity in women's involvement in pious Christian and Islamic movements in Europe. She also researched secular governmentality in the context of discourses and practices of European multiculturalism with a focus on the centrality of gender and sexuality therein. She centrally addresses homonationalism in the Netherlands and in Belgium and produced a documentary, a film on that topic in 2007 called Pink Camouflage. More recently, Sarah's work has centered on the rise of anti-gender mobilizations. She's published widely in journals such as the British Journal of Sociology, Theory, Culture, and Society, European Journal of Women's Studies, Critical Research on Religion, and the Journal of Religion and Gender. Sarah is currently the principal investigator of a research project called Engendering Europe's, uh, in quotes, Muslim question, end of quotes, uh, funded by the Dutch Research Council. The project looks at, at the systematic ways in which Muslims in Europe are problematized. Her focus is on the biopolitical and governmentality dimensions. This research led her to investigate, together with Luis Manuel Hernandez Aguiar, um, population replacement conspiracy thinking. And in a few weeks, their co-edited volume, Politics of Replacement, Demographic Fears, Conspiracy Theories, and Race Wars, published by Routledge, um, will be out. And I think there are flyers here with a discount code at the symposium for anybody who would like to uh, purchase that. Sarah is currently working on a trade book in Dutch on replacement thinking, and it's scheduled to be published next year, and on a book on Europe's, quote, Muslim question, un end quote, for Cambridge, Uni Cambridge University Press series on race, religion, constellations. Please join me in welcoming our wonderful colleague, Sarah. Thank you so much for that introduction, Paula. Um, thank you also very much for the invitation, Navrati, and thank you for organizing the Center Interdisciplinary and Critical, Critical Inquiry, uh, for organizing this uh, important and much needed uh, conversation, this symposium. I'm grateful to be in conversation uh, with all the colleagues today, the colleagues up here and the colleagues in the room. Um, and I'm also noting, um, even though we did not have a conversation before about who would be talking about what. I am noting many echoes and resonances and convergences that, um, yeah, that I really think uh, is well important and 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 fruitful. Um, and and just very briefly on that, um, Christy, in some of the research we have been doing, we have also looked also with some of my research assistants at the Boumediene quote and came to exactly the same conclusion as. <laughs> you have so yes these uh, resonances are, um, are are striking and and also they give me hope somehow okay um, so my talk today I would like to start by uh, giving you sharing some background to this talk so it was kind of already mentioned in 2021 together with Luis Manuel Hernandez Aguilar I organized a conference at the University of Amsterdam called The Politics of Replacement, Demographic Fears, Conspiracy Theories and Race Wars. And the aim was really to gather scholars uh, working on the imaginaries and the discourses centered on the idea that a national population is under threat of being overtaken um, or even wiped out uh, by those who are considered as alien to the nation. Um, and that this is the result of a concerted effort by um, elites. And I very much uh, uh, agree with what D Dorian has, has said earlier on, on the, the 
how these discourses are structurally anti-Semitic and the imagination of, of, of the elites. In our research, we have found that, yes, indeed, the elites are often the Jews, but indeed also the so-called multiculturalist, the feminist. Um, and also just to note on that, that some of the violence that has happened in the name of these uh, conspiracy theories have all, has also focused on the elites. And I'm thinking here of Breivik's uh, attack uh, or massacre uh, on the island of uh, Utoya, um, that was a very deliberate, it wasn't an accident, it was a very deliberate choice not um, to target those people whom he thought should not be in Norway, right? So the immigrants, the people of color, the Muslims, but to focus on those people who he thought were responsible for bringing those people to Norway. So leftist elites, and in this case, young uh, people in training to become, um, yeah, uh, so, so it was a socialist training camp. Um, okay, so we noted with, with my colleague Louise that these replacement conspiracy theories, and I kind of make a point out of it of all, all, always calling them conspiracy theories, which has been my way uh, to think about some of the comments uh, that Eric has made about why are we reproducing the language of theory and, and some of the other comments. Uh, so I, and Eric has made me think now that maybe it's not enough, but anyway, um, <laughs> my talk is written with conspiracy theories. So, uh, so replacement conspiracy theories that they are on the rise again entering more prominently into mainstream ven venues. And just to give you a Dutch example, in the Netherlands, there are currently 28 out of 150 parliamentary seats occupied by candidates belonging to parties who explicitly refer to replacement conspiracies in their political speeches. So that's almost 20% of the Dutch parliament. And so we were looking for a scholarly community to think through this rise and this spread together, like, like we're doing today. The conference brought together a group of scholars working with very different theoretical and methodological approaches from very different social scientific and humanities fields and interdisciplinary backgrounds. I do think it's the interdisciplinarity here is crucial to think this through. And also working with different geographical case studies across Europe in our case mostly, but also North, touching upon North America, Southeast Asia and Oceania and in different uh, time periods, uh, medieval archives, colonial archives, Nazi archives, post-colonial migration, and their archives, 9-11 archives, and so forth. Um, now, this conference led to an edited volume, which is the one that will be out in a couple of weeks. And as it often happens, not all papers that are presented at a, at a conference make it um, to, uh, for various reasons, to the edited volume. And one of those papers has been on my mind ever since. This was a paper by Annalise, Moore, dear colleague Annalise Morse, entitled The Location of Replacement, which implored an audience at the conference who was very much focused on the production of population replacement conspiracy theories to acknowledge that the organized politics of population replacement actually occur not as paranoid imaginations of the mind, but as actual concerted efforts to govern populations through resettlement, confinement, control, and also violence and annihilation. And Annalise Morse laid out this argument with a location and a context that she context that she knows intimately after a lifetime, she's retired now, after a lifetime of ethnographic, ethnographic work and that is the context of Palestine. And this begs the question, what does it mean to think through what we at the conference called the politics of replacement and what maybe perhaps here at the symposium we call demos anxiety? Not in terms of white supremacist paranoia, but in terms of being subjected to settler colonial rule. And more importantly, how are these two, might these two be related? So the conspiracy theories and the actual being subjected to, uh, poli to actual politics of replacement. Um, so with the absence of this paper um, and all the other papers um, focusing on replacement conspiracies, before our book is even published, we are already aware of a dimension that is missing from the analysis, that is the exploration of replacement conspiracies relating to actual politics of replacement, notably in the context of settler colonialism and colonialism to court. 
So to think through this dimension is the stake of my paper today. But I must also admit that while trying to write these papers in the last uh, couple of weeks, the violence tied up with settler colonial rule, as it has been unfolding before our eyes in Palestine and Israel, has been overwhelming and at sometimes paralyzing. So I also feel that I didn't get far enough in the argument, but I'm going to offer you what I have. The argument departs from and is informed by three scenes. Scenes of conspirational replacement thinking, of paranoia, if you will, that seem critical to me in understanding the demos anxiety that we are talking about today and in exploring that connection between the conspirational replacement thinking and actual politics of replacing placement. Scene number one. The first scene is the one that is closest in proximity to my usual here and now. So here, not here Berkeley, but here Amsterdam. Um, and it's also the one that might have been, that has been addressed already uh, most elaborately today, and that is contemporary France, where uh, Renaud Camus has elaborated his great replacement conspiracy theory, which has become the signature, if you want, at least in Europe, because I do know that in the US, uh, white genocide is a more widespread signature for some of these uh, conspirational theories. Um, that has become the signature of the kind of thought or ideology that we're discussing here today. While we shouldn't stay in France in the 1910s to understand what this great replacement is, and I think many of the papers today have actually made that point as well in different ways, um, and this is an argument, I, I, I did want to repeat that because this is an argument in response to some of the accounts that I, uh, I have heard regularly who present replacement thinking as a new phenomenon. So while we shouldn't stay in that contemporary moment, it is important to look more carefully at how Camus' argument is constructed. And here I rely heavily on the deep archival and smart analysis, analytical work of Lou Mousset, who is here today, who has looked carefully at the intellectual production of the Grèce, which is the Groupement de Recherche et d'Études pour la Civilisation Européenne that has in well-concerted and deliberate ways cultivated the intellectual grounds, grounds, if you want, from where the thought of Camus could so easily emerge and gain traction. The Grèce was established in 1968 and was a deliberate exercise of intellectual reconfiguration on the far right after a general loss of legitimacy of fascism as well as colonialism in post-war and so post-Shoah and post-independence, notably the Algerian War of Independence, uh, France. And the Grèce explicitly aimed at developing a new framework of thinking including new terminology. So the question of terminology was one that was also very high on their agenda, um, in which at least partially delegitimized fascist and colonialist, in other words, white supremacist ideas, could find a new articulation and indeed a new social life so that they could gain traction again. Their project was one for the long haul. It was a retreat from immediate politics, the disqualified politics, um, to a um, kind of a metapolitical project and doing intellectual work with the aim of establishing new cultural hegemony. And unsurprisingly, the Grèce refers to Gramsci as a figure of inspiration in their work. Um, it was the project of the establishment of the new right. And indeed, we might consider the current traction of replacement thinking in France, um, with Camus, of course, as we all know, being a best-selling author who is invited to talk shows on primetime television and so forth, um, and less focused on him as a person, as an individual, just the fact that, that his ideas are being rolled out so smoothly we could uh, consider that as the harvest of some of this deliberate intellectual and political work done uh, by the Grèce. So within this intellectual production, a notion that is elaborated, that is relevant for the argument here, and it has already been uh, discussed today, this is part of the convergences, is of course the notion of reverse colonization. Lou Mousset traces that notion in the writings of the Grèce. Um, actually, the chapter uh, in the book that is coming out by Lou is precisely um, on tracing that notion. 
and finds its early articulations in terms especially of how decolonization is uh, discussed. So before we go to reverse, um, reverse colonization, there's the notion of decolonization, how it, how it is discussed within the Grèce at the end of the 1960s already, notably in writings by Alain de Benoit. And the labor of re-articulation with respect to, de to decolonization is noteworthy. While from the inception of the Grèce, um, it, it, the Grèce was clearly marked by what uh, Renato Rosaldo qualifies as imperialist nostalgia, this nostalgia doesn't lead to a straightforward rejection of decolonization as one might imagine it, but rather it leads to the Benoit making an argument for the decolonization of Europe. And um, there's a quote for which, again, I have to thank um, Lou Mousset, a quote that she found in the archive, which I think is worth um, uh, reading to you. And this is so a quote by uh, de Benoit. Here it goes. Decolonization is a fact and a given. It took place in the name of the right of peoples to self-determination. In other words, in the name of the inalienable right, inalienable right of specifically defined human communities to become aware of themselves and to ensure their destiny through their own genius. We must go further. Colonization is not only physical and historical, mental colonization also exists. Cultural colonization has been manifested everywhere and since a very long time. Decolonization must be total, and total decolonization is reciprocal decolonization, end of quote. So this affirmation for the need of a total and reciprocal decolonization, the call to shed all kinds of cultural influences and to return to one's own culture, lays the ground for another well-known member of the Grèce, although he did get expelled twice from the group, Guillaume Fay to write his infamous book, La Colonisation de l'Europe, The Colonization of Europe. So the groundwork for this argument took, um, uh, have occurred a, a few decades ago, we might argue, and it relies not only on de Benoit's work on decolonization since the 1960s, but also on an effective reworking of this imperial nostalgia over actual decolonization and the Algerian War of Independence. Um, and the thesis that comes out of this effective work and this um, discursive work um, represents a move, as Mousset argues, from the disputes between nostalgic partisans of a French Algeria and those worried about the coming of Algerian France, to use Todd Shepard's expression. And this thesis is, it is now Europe that is colonized by immigrants and by Muslims. We have heard this before today. And the book, the thesis that is developed in the book, the book is drenched in anti-immigration rhetoric and is, is, is in Islamophobia in blatant ways that in fact breaks with the style of the Grèce. And you could see a bit of the, you can taste a bit of the difference here between uh, the, the argument of decolonization must be reciprocal uh, or um, yeah, the kind of argument that Faye makes in um, La Colonisation de l'Europe. It also got Faye and conviction for incitement to racial hatred, his book. Now, with the grounds of an argument on reverse colonialism well elaborated over a few decades, and with Faye putting uh, the more far right fringe version, I mean, and it's actually disturbing that by saying this, um, I might suggest, we might suggest that, that Camus would not be as far right as Faye, right? But okay, so with Faye putting out the more far right fringe version out there by the, at the turn of the century, which get the, gets a formal conviction in court, the lay of the land is favorable for Camus' great replacement conspiracy theory by the 1910s, uh, sorry, by the 2010s. The reworking of decolonization in effect led to the argument of reverse colonization and Camus' work is deeply informed by both. And we've already heard examples for that, from that from the opening quote of Le Grand Remplacement uh, with a quote from Franz Fanon. 
um, uh, which Camus has affirmed on several occasions as one of the authors that has inspired him to, in the book as well, the language of invasion, the right to self-defense, the right to fight against invasion, the right to one's own identity, but this time all applied to France and to Europe. What I would like to get at is this. There is a, this is a clear case of classical victim perpetrator reversal, which some have argued, and I'm thinking here of Wodak's uh, 2015 book, The Politics of Fear, What Right-Wing Discourses Mean, which some have argued is central to contemporary far-right discourses, mm -hmm. uh, both about great replacement and white uh, genocide. A victim perpetrator reversal in which populations racialized as white, populations that were instrumental in advancing European colonialism, settler colonialism, and extractive racial capitalist formations, and populations sometimes perpetrated actual colonial geno genocides are now being cast as being under existential threat by the formerly colonized and by racialized populations. Take you now to scene number two. The second scene takes me further back from the here and now, away from the discourse of decolonization, for instance, yet it brings me to another disturbing proximity. When I think or write about population replacement conspiracies in my mother tongue, which is Dutch, and I am writing this uh, trade book in Dutch at the moment, I am stuck with a word that is the accepted translation or equivalent for replacement, and that is the word omvolking. The term immediately brings us to the German umvolkung, which is a terminology invented and deployed under the Nazi regime in the 1930s. So every time we use this word in Dutch to describe, to report, to analyze, to critique, every time it is used in the Dutch parliament by those political parties who use the word and represent almost 20% of the popular vote, we are rely relying on Nazi terminology. Umvolkung was a term that was first used in the German nationalist propaganda during the First, um, uh, the first World War and was subsequently elaborated by Albert Brackmann in the 1920s and early 1930s. Its most literal translation would be something like ethnic or national, and this is the difficulties of translating the term folk, right? So ethnic, national, inversion ethnic transformation, if you want. Brackmann was a German nationalist historian and a Nazi ideologue who was made responsible for the Ostforschung, the research on populations and regions in the eastern borders of Germany, a term um, uh, that is with us since the 18th century. And he became the director in the 1930s of an institution, an organization actually called Ostforschung. The research that he conducted and oversaw was solic solicited on a regular basis by the Nazi government and administration. This was research that directly informed Nazi policies uh, of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Originally, Umvolkung referred to a deliberate strategy to render the eastern borderlands of Germany, so imagine parts of Poland, also Czechoslovakia at the time, to render them more German a strategy of Germanization of what Brackmann deemed German-friendly populations, that is to say, populations with a potential to Germanize. And here there is the distinction in mind, what, what, what was on the mind, of course, here was uh, the difference between the Volksdeutsche and the Reichsdeutsche, so the German minorities or that were part of Germ Germany as it was imagined, but that were not part of the state of Germany with the aim of consolidating and also expanding those German minorities with the aim of expanding the state of Germany eventually. Concretely, these were East European populations near the border. Umvolkung was then established through a combined strategy of repopulation under with strict regimes of migration control and settlement control, who could settle where in those border regions, and of cultural Germanization with an emphasis on language. Strikingly, Eastern Polish Jews were incorporate, incorporated into these Germanization strategies 
as the great doctoral doctoral work of uh, Dasha or Darya uh, Klingenberg shows, um, a PhD researcher at the Viadrina University in Frankfurt Oder, shows that based on the idea that linguistically Yiddish was closer to German than the Slavic language of Poland, Polish, and hence Eastern Polish Jews might be useful as a kind of second best to the real thing in Germanizing these regions. This is what Umvulkung originally stand for, stood for. During the 1930s, the discourse radically shifted. While the repopulation efforts and indeed the expansionary nationalist politics continued, and while the term Umvulkung continued to be used, its meaning was reworked in a process once more uh, marked by a reversal. Umvulkung ceased to refer to the ongoing expansionary politics and came to denote the fear of white German populations being replaced by others. For this labor of re-articulation, the work of the demographer, and we're back to demography, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Burdorfer was crucial. Burdorfer wrote three crucial books for the intellectual elaboration and uh, propagation of population replacement discourses. And I just want to give you uh, the titles of the book because of the three books, because I think they, uh, I think the titles, um, uh, you know, sometimes they say don't uh, judge a, a book by its cover. I think <laughs> these books, um, the cover gives it away. So, the decline of the birth rate and its combat, the vital question of the German people, German people published in 1929. Uh, uh, Are white people dying? The future of white and colored people in light of biological statistics, published in 1934, and German people in need, published in 1935. Um, in these publications, the re-articulation of birth rates as a war strategy and as a key arena for life of the nation was solidified from a position of power and scripted in a racial wealth unshowing, in a racial worldview. As Gisela, the historian, feminist historian Gisela uh, Boch's uh, work uh, documents, it is also from this position of power that concrete governmental policies were developed and implemented to incite white reproduction while curtailing the reproduction of life, so-called unworthy of life. When with, within more or less um, of a decade, Umvolkung, in other words, shifted from denoting nationalist Nazi expansion and colonial politics, if you want, um, to understanding, to the same nation understanding itself under threat, the threat of population inversion, of being replaced by others. And in this sense, the existential threat, we are being replaced. Um, and and in, in this sense of existential threat, of we are being replaced, Jews, who initially were seen as a potential useful agent of Germanization in the Polish regions, were cast in, as in a protagonist role of what Camus chillingly and in total dehumanization calls the replacers, les remplaçants. Something in this scene is particularly revelatory as the spotlight is directed on the one term or one discourse, umvolkung, where the victim perpetrator reversal takes place in the space of a few years, as Nazi propaganda is in full development. From being a self-acknowledged perpetrator of umvolkung, the German regime claimed the status of being its victim, a victim of umvolkung as a discourse of existential threat to the German nation was elaborated. And this is the threat of, I'm thinking of another term here that is um, um, important to think with, I think, the threat of thinning, the Bevölkerung Verdunung, the thinning, uh, the dissolving evaporation of uh, the German nation and therefore, uh, the, and not therefore, and the loss of racial uh, purity or the thinning of racial purity. My last scene, scene number three. In the third scene, I want to inf uh, bring us further back in time, but closer in space, at least here, uh, in the space of the United States of America. 
While the terminology of replacement thinking might not be so widespread in the U.S. and white genocide is, is more used here, although in the book there is a chapter by uh, Emilie uh, de Keulenaar and Mark Tutors, um, who are scholars of... Um, uh, who, who analyze the digital sphere, and there's an analysis of digital environments where these two languages of um, Demo's anxiety, if you want, are increasingly articulated to each other. So in right-wing online environments, so the language of uh, white uh, genocide and the language of the great uh, replacement. So that merge, that merging is actually happening in the last five years. Um, so... Why, while it might not be so widespread yet uh, in the US, the language of replacement thinking, um, colleague Leo Lucassen argues that replacement thinking has deep North American roots. And this brings us back once again to the significance of European settler colonialism for the historical development of these conspiracy theories. Lucassen's point of reference is how in the US from the 1880s onwards, the ongoing immigration from Europe and in particular immigration from Eastern and Southern European countries increasingly became a matter of concern among scholars, pub politicians and journalists. In 1891, the economist and stati uh, statistician Francis Amasa Walker, who served as the commissioner of Indian affairs and led the US census twice before becoming the third president of MIT, was the first to compile a comprehensive statistical case for what soon would be known as race suicide. The term race suicide itself was coined in 1900 by the sociologist, coming back to my own discipline here, the sociologist Edward Ellsworth Ross, who further developed the concept in his 1901 essay called The Causes of Race Superiority, in which he warned, uh, warned of the degeneration of the Anglo-Saxons in the US, notably if Chinese and Japanese labor migrants were allowed, or migration was allowed to continue. The essay made a case, as Alice Weinbaum uh, puts it in her work on the race reproduction bind, that, and I quote, the immigration of unassimilable elements must cease. Meanwhile, Anglo-Saxons must reproduce a racially superior nation with haste. And it seems, by the way, but probably people in the audience know more about this, it seems that Ross might have been the first case that prompted uh, the AAUP into existence as his writings on race suicide, while he was professor of sociology at Stanford, uh, were unacceptable to Jane Stanford and Jane Stanford basically fired him as a tenured professor, prompting a discussion uh, on academic freedom. Um, so the concept of race suicide gained significant traction in the following years in the US. It was, for instance, mobilized by Theodore Roosevelt in different uh, speeches and essays, also among white feminists like Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Its best known usage, perhaps, is of course, or not, yeah, not perhaps, is of course in Madison's grant, uh, The Passing of the Great Race or Racial Bias of European History, published in 1916. According to Grant, the US, as we probably all know in this space, like in, when, when I talk about this in Europe, it, it's, it's much less known, but I am assuming that uh, people here know, know much more about this. Uh, the US was a Nordic country populated by what he considered the superior Nordic race, and it was committing race suicide as it was outbred, between quotation marks, um, by immigrants and so-called other inferior races, including what he saw as inferior white races, such as what he called the Alpine and the Mediterranean races. The book was influential in various ways, including its impact on racist immigration laws of 1921 and 1924 that would restrict Im uh, immigration from Asia and Euro Eastern Europe, and notably of Jews from Eastern Europe. Another transatlantic white supremacist connection. We've already heard some of them earlier today. Um, Hitler was a great admirer of Grant and qualified the passing of the great race as, 
and this is a quote, his Bible, which somehow made me think of yet one another of these uh, connections that was mentioned just earlier today, how Steve Bannon refers to Le Camp des Saints as the book he keeps on his nightstand. Grant had many followers, was not a marginal figure at the time, including Lorthrop Stoddard, who was a member of the American Eugenics Society and the Ku Klux Klan, and a founding member of the American uh, Birth Control League, and who in 1920 wrote one of the most pristine historical examples of population replacement with his The Rising Tide of Color, the, the th threat against um, white world supremacy, which postulates demographic growth of people of color as an existential threat to white supremacy. Now, I don't have the time now to trace this intellectual genealogy in more detail, but basically the notion of race suicide as a relatively mainstream concern among the establishment at the time, which of course was a white establishment, um, over the years becomes white suicide. So, so from race suicide becomes white genocide, which currently is, is the terminology um, most used among white supremacists in the US. There's an important element in Grant's way of thinking that I would still like to highlight here before I go to my conclusions. In the passing of the great race, Grant affirms uh, white people in the US, um, that is to say white European settlers, um, as natives, natives that need to be protected. And remember also that Grant was, and is still recognized today, uh, a great uh, conserv conservationist, right? Um, this move has been taken on and has been further elaborated by many followers of Grant. For instance, the infamous, and here we really go to the fringes of the white supremacist far right, the infamous David Lane, the white supremacist terrorist, made repeated arguments that it was important to preserve the endangered species of North America, which included the American bison, 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 and the Native American. The Native American, which is a term that he reserved for white Americans of Nordic heritage. In other words, once more an unfathomable reversal in light of the genocide of Native Americans and the genocide of the transatlantic slave trade and the institution of chattel slavery. Another unfathomable reservoir, he claims white ingenuity and he claims white people to be under threat. I will conclude now. What do these three scenes, and I'm not really sure why I got stuck on the word scenes and I don't know what, they, what kind of scenes they are. Maybe, maybe they are crime scenes, I don't know. So what do these three scenes of Demo's anxiety point to? A dizzying, mirror palace of reversals that makes one's head and frankly one's heart spin. A victim perpetrator reversal, a reversal of colonization, a reversal of indigeneity. The subject who has enacted and in most cases continues to do so, settler colonial violence and colonial violence comes to understand itself as the one who has an original claim to territory and the one who is under threat of replacement, of umvolkung, of genocide. A subject who cannot see and cannot take in, who disavows the foundational violence that its own subjectivity is tied to as perpetrator. And that foundational violence that has comes back to haunt the paranoia that all the violence will hit this white colonial slash settler colonial subject like a boomerang. And allow me to use this image or this object connected to Aboriginal livelihoods only days after the, Aborigin after the Australian people have voted against an Aboriginal, uh, an indigenous vote in the parliament in Australia. What rests is the violence and the destruction of so-called self-defense, of radical reciprocal decolonization. It's the actual possibility of changing power relations, and now for a moment I'm interrupting this white settler colonial paranoia, um, and, and these 
actual changing power relations that interrupt that paranoia and that have produced a world making in the aftermath of decolonization, of abolition, of liberation that have actually created more livable worlds, more space to breathe, that has begun to undo the coloniality of power. So it's the actual possibility and the actual practices that we do see of dismantling white supremacy and its patriarchal foundations, coupled with the imaginary impossibility to conceive of a new, more equal social relations in a way that is livable, that animates this paranoia and conspirational thinking. In this fame, we can understand population replacement conspiracies as part of settler colonial afterlives, if you want. The violence of settler colonialism and of colonialism, of replacement, of umvolkung, of genocide, not only begets violence, it also begets a deeply entrenched paranoia. And I didn't know how to end um, this paper well, and so I want to end it with the words by a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Melbourne, Sahar Gumkur, also one of the contributors of the book. Um, who I think has really caught the core of this paranoia in the following few lines. What of a greater terror than white people who have historically been in a position of privilege, imagined in full recognition, seeing themselves as no longer superior to others, but as equals? The paranoia of losing privilege is decried as replacement, as being rendered irrelevant or equated with being extinguished, a death by equality. Thank you. I, um, I, I was thanking you for, for incredibly rich talk um, and, uh, and attempts to put together this colonial genealogy in concert with all the people that you've been working with, which I think is really exciting for us to know that other people are out there working on this stuff. Um, for me, um, that's very important. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I don't have much to say except um, tremendous um, uh, gratitude and excitement about about the possibilities because I think you're also gesturing towards something that we might be able to do, right? Um, but but just in a, a brief response to this idea of scenes, I think partly what your remarks today offer are a, a you know, global or planetary understanding of um, something that far exceeds the nation state frame, paradoxically, right, because the, the nation frame is fundamental <laughs> as you were tracing it through the German, uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm not even gonna pretend to say the word, but um, the, the idea of folk, right, that, that it's foundational. And I'm thinking of um, Amdani's recent book, Neither Settler Nor Native, where he traces this back again to 1492, as you are in a, in a sense doing here, thinking of settlement itself as a, as a population replacement, right? Displacement, replacement, um, as Patrick Wolfe and others have, have, um, have articulated it. So I think that maybe one of the horizons here is an attempt to uh, uh, grapple with this on a, a planetary scale, at least at least as as large and wide as your colonial modernity. Um, and then one of the other things that you know I hope we'll talk about more, you know, in in the months and years to follow, uh, in this community that we're bu we're building is this the centrality of settlement, uh, which you're tracking so carefully here. Um, so it's I don't know. It seems to me that the, the the scenes, the image of the scene, is partly sort of these snapshots that both uh, on a historical continuum um, and also on a planetary one and a you know trans imperial one. Um, so that that was just a uh, a remark that came to mind. Thank you. No, I don't know if I. <laughs> Yeah, it's so, there was a moment that I, the word snapshot came to my mind and I thought, no, it, it, it sounded too light. I, I stuck to scenes, but, but I do think indeed that we have to um, make the dots, make the connections. And actually in the book, um, so the chapters are very different, very different case studies, different disciplinary um, takes on all of this. And 
I, I, given that I'm one of the editors and we had to write the introduction, that kind of pushed us to make this connection. So we have to write an introduction that can hold all of these different pieces of scholarship that go in more detail. Um, and we kept it kind of like, let's say, uh, yeah, yeah we, if you want the... Um, well, m modernity, let's let's call it modernity uh, from 1492 modernity. Like we, we kept that as kind of a framework and say like, okay, the uh, thinking with colonialism, uh, settler colonialism, um, replacement uh, fear as, as a paranoia connected to settler colonialism. And then there's a last chapter, and this is a dear friend, colleague, Anja Topolsky, who was a respondent in, in one of the conference, uh, at the conference, she hadn't presented um, a full paper at the conference, but she was there the entire time. And she was like, could I, could I also add a chapter working with older sources? And I was like, okay, go for it. And so she goes back to this legend of the King of Tars, which is a medieval legend. Um, I, I, I can't reproduce it here on, on the spot, um, but tracing many of, that was actually written at the time of the Crusades, and tracing many of the threads that I thought we had neatly put together in this context of, you know, modernity, uh, 1492 modernity and so forth, and sh showing many of that threads in just that analysis of this King of Tars uh, myth, uh, in, in, in the time of the, in the medieval cru crusade time. And I was, you know, it, it, it upsets our entire framework, but I was like, yeah, sure, let's go for it. It will be the last chapter to open it up again. And so this never ending, yeah, it's a genealogy that in a sense never stops. I still want to make the point that it's crucial to understand and in relation to, yeah, modern European white colonialism, like that, that is, that remains crucial for me. But I also, and it might be a bit of mm, the search for the holy grail to find, you know, mm -hmm. the point of origin of replacement thinking. I don't think it works like that. But to keep those connections and the openness of like, maybe there's still other archives we need to look at to understand this well. And we, one of the concepts that we use in the introduction of the book is that of a palimpsest, right? So it's overwriting the archives and using, you know, the same parchment, but then with a different inscription. So, yeah, that is something we've been trying to grapple with. But yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I'm sorry if I'm not, you know, aware of all the details. I do more uh, biblical texts and conspiracy theories. Um, that's really what I'm really diving into right now. Um, but uh, so speaking of scenes, right, um, I'm interested in mythology and origin stories um, in the sense of like within these particular narratives. And so I I'm curious, um, speaking of Madison Grant, or, well, where well, you were talking about, you know, the Nordic, the, the original Nordic people that, or the indigenous people here were Nordic. So I, I wonder now, um, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk, particularly within um, you know, here here within America about talking about, you know, the whole 1492, uh, not really, uh, where the Vikings came before. Um, I, I'd be interested in your take on that. Is that now a, 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 a recreated now mythology that is feeding into this sort of white supremacist um, uh, mythology that's, that's growing within uh, American culture? So thank you. I'm, thank you for that. That is, um, I am not sure that I can speak to that. Um, I do know in some of our divisions of labor with my collaborator, um, Luis uh, Hernandez Aguilar, um, that he did most of going down the rabbit hole of the internet right-wing fringes, right? I do know there's a lot of Nordic stuff coming up there, but I didn't go in there so deep as he did, and I don't know if I can really give a well-informed answer to that. But yes, the, the Nordic stuff is, is all over the place, but yeah, I, I'm not the best person to speak to that, yeah. Um, thank you for that. I think your talk for me really um, underscored one of the ways that the right wing version of this replaces theory today has succeeded in passing itself off as not being a kind of technology or politics of demographic control. 
And I think you're contextualizing it in this longer history and you're insistent pointing to the ways in which these groups are gaining and like real political power, you know, really highlights the the continuities or this this great replacement theory as a kind of population management itself, even though that's what it's ostensibly arguing against. Um, so an, another kind of just comment, but that was really um, yeah. productive from what I took from your talk. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And I think we've already talked a lot. That has been one common thread through many of uh, the presentations of all the reversals, right? And so there's that going on for sure. It It, it is a take on population management and how populations should be imagined in their relation to territory and who should be on which territory. So that that is going on as well, uh, clearly. Um, but what I see happening as well in relation, for instance, to think of another reversal to all the discourse on the takes on the globalist, right? The bad globalist, the villain globalist. These networks are very well connected globally, right? They actually have training camps. Like, yeah, in, in I know that some of the re replacement thinkers, or no, now I'm saying thinkers, thinking cons conspirationalists, um, in in Belgium, for instance, um, they have gone to training camps in Hungary, right? So there's there's the, you know the global scale of this and the global organization of this is uh, striking. And at the same time, there's that anti-globalist discourse. So that all of these ironies and reversals are, yeah, that's, I, I think the word that I used uh, in the conclusion was like this crazy mirror palace. And I don't know if that's the right word, but there's something um, uh, mind-blowing going, not mind-blowing, uh, mind-boggling going on there. Yeah, but thank you for that. So just two quick comments. Um, this notion that the um, replacement theorists would be projecting onto the so-called population managers, their own desire to manage populations makes me think of um, Adorno and Horkheimer and the dialect of, dialectic of enlightenment famously arguing that um, the Nazis projected onto the Jews their own thirst for world domination. Um, uh, so that's that's one thing. Um, uh, the, the, the second thing has to do with projection, since uh, Christy brought it up, um, uh, and paranoia, Sarah, since you bring it up, and also my desire to sort of reappropriate Fanon from the appropriators. Um, that Fanon has become the, the, the right's favorite philosopher of late. It's not just Camus, Pierre-Andier Taguerre kind of cites him against the green, um, and there are other examples. Um, uh, I, I was just thinking of um, if we want to talk about the sort of white racist or uh, white settler paranoia, I was thinking of, of, of Fanon's notions about a white projective paranoia. This is in black skin, white masks in this um, sort of tossed off aside in a note um, uh, that I, I pulled up for myself so I didn't screw it up. Um, but um, he's arguing that that uh, there, there was sort of a fundamental white fear that, you know, given the opportunity, blacks would sort of return the, the treatment that they had received. So 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 he, he anatomized the, 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 this kind of paranoid projection in this way. He said that since the white man behaves in an insulting manner toward the black man, he realizes that if he were black, he would have no mercy for his aggressors. And so I think this is this kind of paranoid projection sort of underlies the imputation of violence um, to so-called re replacers um, uh, that speaks uh, to this long genealogy of sort of a uh, uh, hunted white psychology. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, and I do think, yeah, that I need to go more back to, to, to Fanon. So thank you for that. It, it reminds me of that, I don't know if people are familiar with a meme. I don't remember where I saw it first, Facebook, Twitter, um, whatever. Uh, X, um, but <laughs> that meme that plays with that, right, which says something like, uh, in, in relation to uh, replacement fears and so forth, um, in relation basically to the discourse of, you know, by year, I don't know how, which year whites will become a minority. So in relation to that, there's the meme saying like, um, oh, what's the problem with becoming a minority? Have minorities been treated badly, right? So playing with that. Um, but yeah, I think it is precisely about that, that paranoia, yeah. 